Hello, welcome to Board Game Bonkers. I'm Jay Sears, and oh boy, was this a hard list to put together. We're going to take a look at the best value board games between 40 to 60 pounds. Now, because this was so difficult, I have got some honorable mentions. That was M and R. Which ones are put on? What they take off? Let's just cover them anyway. Now, before we get into this list, please do consider subscribing to the channel. If you just clicked on this and you haven't subscribed for more content like this, and please do check out other lists in this series. We'll look at the best value board games for £20 or less, and also we'll be looking at the best value board games for £60 and more, which will be our next one in the series. So let's now dive into this list and check out honourable mentions first. We've got three of them to go through. Our first honourable mention is Alien Frontiers, which you can pick up for £60. The reason why it's not on the list, because I felt it's £60. I felt like others perhaps provide more depth and value than this, but this is a classic and one of my favourites. You love dice chucking, you'll enjoy this. So what do you do in Alien Frontiers? Well, each player will take turns and you'll be rolling your dice, which are your ships. You'll be signing them to these different spots that gain benefits from these orbital facilities. Now, you're trying to make use of alien tech cards you can collect during the game. You can mitigate dice, for example, and they also enhance your actions. And the whole point in doing this is to try and colonise and put these colonies out, using them to gain control of these territories on the planet. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. If you're trying to get more dice, which is your ships, you'll be then getting resources. You'll be trying to colonise but colonies on. The more colonies you've got, the more points you will get. You don't get a lot of points because it depends on how many colonies you've got and the territories. And you also gain this bonus tile if you gain control of the territory, which gives you a bit of a benefit. Really good game. Really enjoy this. Yes, there's luck, but the alien tech cards can mitigate that luck slightly. Fantastic, thematic, themed game. Really enjoyable. A classic, one that will always probably still remain in my collection. Let's move on to our next honourable mention. That is Wingspan. This comes in at about £55. The reason why it's not on the list is because I felt that it didn't offer enough, get enough depth for the price point. And I felt there's a couple of gimmicky things in here that really weren't that necessity for the game. So, for example, the dice tower that you've got. Do you really need that? Not really. So what do you do in Wingspan? Well, at the start of your turn, you'll be able to take any of the four available actions where you're placing a cube in the leftmost uh, exposed slot on your player board or activating bird powers, um, that's in the bird cards, in the row from left to right. You also have these bird cards that you can action. Now, your actions are you can put a bird card from your hand onto your player board. You can gain food by rolling the number of dice indicated and putting them in the dice tower. And then you can lay eggs. What you're trying to do is you're trying to lay these eggs by placing an egg on that particular bud card to show they've laid the egg. And you can draw more bud cards. Now you gain points at the end of each round with different uh, collections, the number of buds you've got, for a particular type, eggs you've got, and also end game scoring. And that's essentially what you've been doing throughout the whole of the game. So there's a bit of tabloid building and there's a bit of action selection there as well so a lot of people enjoy wingspan you can see why i just didn't feel it was deep enough to get onto the list i think there were other games i actually prefer over this my other honorable mention is fiddy culture coming out at 45 pound i was so close to getting this onto the list but i felt i've covered it in another list which just mentioned it's honorable mention so this is a vineyard you'll be taking people on tours worker placement placing workers out you also got your own player board where you can upgrade that, you're getting Vine cards to place onto your uh, top of your, thing, your player board, and then they'll produce grapes. Those grapes will also be produced into your barrels, which are turned into wine, and, and you'll be fulfilling orders. So essentially, just place a worker, carry the, the worker, you've got a, a, two different phases, summer and winter phases, and then you'll be deciding how many workers you use in summer and how many workers you use in phase, because you've no um, limit, you have no limit on that. You can choose as many as you want in each phase, but you just got the number of workers and you can gain certain upgrades on your player boards. That's a very brief overview of the game. It is a classic uh, considered and it's very well thought of amongst the board gaming community and it, it does have a good theme and sense to it if you like wine making. I'm not a fan of wine making, but it is an enjoyable game. So let's now move on to our top 10, starting with our number 10. And this is Raiders of the North Sea, coming in at £50. Now, this is where I was struggling about where to put this. Do I put for the culture at number 10? Do I put this as an honourable mention? 
I really do enjoy Raiders of the North Sea. I think it's a nice family weight game. <clears throat> what you'll be doing, worker placement, place a worker out, then you'll be taking a worker off a spot. You'll be hiring crew, and with that crew, you'll be then trying to get that crew to work for you and use them to go on raids. Now, the crew cards have two different types of abilities. You have an ability to be equal to the to the into town, uh, <coughs> go to the town hall and carry that ability out of the card to use it and discard it, or you can actually acquire and use that card to go on a raid with you. Now you can have the five, then it's for going on raids. When you go to raids, you carry that raid out. Some require throwing a die. You have a shield value track as well that you can go to a certain action spot in order to increase that, which will help in raids. Some of them are deterministic. So on the cards, it'll tell you in terms of folk the strength of that. Can you just add them up? And that'll tell you where you've met the value for that raid or not. And sometimes you have to roll a die that will go again and used as part of that raid to help you and try and defeat it. And you get uh, the resources. You also can um, satisfy the chieftain by fulfilling a tile order. That will give you victory points. Raids will give you victory points. You also have Valkyrie that you will gain during raids. That's a negative. Every Valkyrie you get, you will lose when you're townsfolk, but you've got this separate track, which will gain you victory points. So essentially, you place a worker down, take a worker back. Now, certain worker spots will require a specific color of worker, for example, white. You can get them in raids. So you need to go in raids to get specific workers. You obviously put a worker down to go in a raid, and you take a worker off. So it's a really unique way of using that worker place mechanism. Really streamlined straightforward in its gameplay and it's certainly got a nice family weight to it. Looks lovely as well, love the artwork. I actually prefer this in the series of these games, both in Architects of the West Kingdom, which is why it's in this list. Let's now move on to a number nine. That is Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion. You pick this up for 45 pounds. Now, the reason why this is not any higher is because essentially you're doing the same. By giving too much away, you're going through this dungeon crawl, this book, you're flipping through the scenarios <coughs> and you'll be carrying out that scenario, going in this dungeon crawl, fighting against different monsters using card combat system, and you'll be drawing cards from a draw pile. Now, that uses a timer as well, because when you run out then, the game is over. So you're trying to fulfill these scenarios. That's a very brief summary about spoiling anything. Now, a lot of people enjoy this, but essentially you will be doing the same thing over and over. And that can become a bit, a bit semi, a little bit tedious for some people. Now, this is a much shorter, simplified version, streamlined over Gloomhaven. If you've got a big grandiose game, then go with Gloomhaven. But if, to be honest, this is a great introductory introductory, say that properly Jay, an introductory system into Gloomhaven. So certainly check this one out, Jaws of the Lion. If you want that dungeon crawl feel in the book system, it's much easier to take out, put away and to set up. Check it out. So let's now move on to our number one, number eight. This is Concordia coming in at £50. Concordia is now considered a classic. So what do you do in Concordia? Well, it's a bit of an economic development of Roman times. So in the game, what you were doing, you've got colonists that you send, uh, send out to cities to gather different resources, and you've got some buildings there as well to claim it. And then each player starts with an identical set of action cards, and you can claim more during the game. Now, during your turn, you play one card from your hand, and you complete the actions associated with the card you played. Now, the cards that have been played will accumulate and a pile, which will be the discard pile. So you'll get them back at some point. Now each card is associated with an ancient god, and each one will reward you for certain achievements. Now players will continue to play cards and complete actions until the game comes to an end. Now players can sometimes purchase personality cards in order to expand the hand and have better actions. Now when the last one is purchased, that's when the end game trigger. So essentially you just go now to these cities, you're gathering these resources, it's going to give you victory points to acquire and conquer these, well, not say conquer these areas, someone's like colonizing these areas, and then you're showing that you influence in those areas. Quite straightforward economic style of game, and it's certainly a classic. And those action cards that make it fascinating and knowing well, what action to take, when to take that action. So let's now move on to a number seven. This is Dune Imperium coming in at £55. 
This is a highly acclaimed game. A lot of people do enjoy this, especially if you're a fan of, of Dune, the film, then you will enjoy this board game. This is arguably the better one out of the Dune board games that are out there. So what do you do in Dune Imperium? Well, this uses a deck building added with a kind of hidden information uh, to worker placements. So we've got the style of deck building and worker placement. Now we start with a unique leader card as well, a deck of cards. Now cards will allow you to kind of send out your agents, so I'll send out your meeples essentially, to set in spaces on the game board, that's your worker placement. Now you can acquire cards during the game and you might become more uh, powerful with military through the use of these. You'll be able to deploy more troops than your opponents, depending on the type of cards you've got. Or you might acquire cards that give you an edge with the four political factions representing the game that you can be part of. Now, unlike many other deck building games, you don't play your entire hand in one turn. Instead, you'll draw a hand of cards at the start of every round and then alternate with other players, taking one turn at a time where you're playing one card to send one of your agents out into the, board, the game board. That's your worker placement. Now, when it's your turn and you have no more agents to place, you'll take a reveal turn. Now, what is that? Revealing the rest of your cards, which will provide persuasion and swords. Now, persuasion is used to acquire more cards, and swords will help your troops fight for the current round's reward, as shown on the conflict card that will be revealed um, each turn. And then what you'll be doing is you're trying to defeat your rivals in combat in that round. So you're trying to work out well, which cards you want to keep back for combat, which ones they need to use for the actions and worker placement. Really fascinating twist there. So it's really fighting and toying back and forth about, I really need this card for this combat, but I really need this action. What do I do? So really fascinating. But check it out, Dune Imperium. Really fascinating twist with uh, what deck building and worker placement. So let's now move on to number six. And I have mentioned this. This is Through the Ages, a new story of civilization. This is a heavy, complex game. You can pick this up for about £55. And if you like thematic civilization games but don't want a full board and instead want to use cards this is despite being comic very well streamlined essentially you've got a row of cards that we laid out different technologies etc what you'll be doing you've got a player board so you get resources and your different technologies you can upgrade your player board by get, acquiring better cards that'll give you better technologies i.e better resources you've got your workers you're trying to get out which you have to put onto those spaces on your player board or the cards that you've put above it which are better to increase better technologies but you need workers to do that you need to feed your workers you need food but you need to also get your production up because you need stone and wood etc to get more cards to build those cards you also have military you have to be careful there's a military track and you have to go up that military track because if you don't there are cards that will punish you because what you'll do there'll be cards that you can play into this stack now these are essentially like event cards that you'll be playing. What they'll do, they'll be revealed. And when they're revealed, then that will determine different outcomes. So for example, I might say if you've got a, a greater number of points um, than the opponent, then you'll lose half, for example. You take away half the points. If you've got more military than them, you have to be careful with that. And you have to be strategic in when you play those particular types of cards um, and then to benefit you. Because there might be cards that say if you've got this type of technology, then you'll gain X amount of points. And you'll be trying to get as many points as possible. The problem is you can't ignore the military because you will get crushed essentially. So it's a really fascinating game and how that works. It's really streamlined for such a complex game. In fact, I find this much easier um, than the likes of Civilization and Who's Done, um, despite the Bogan Gate weight rating being complete two different parallels. But check it out. If you like Civilization game with more of a card system, then this is one you might be worth have a look at because it does use all the aspects of civilization 4x but in a different way now let's now move on to a number five and that's terraforming mars you can pick this up for about 45 pound terraforming mars is certainly becoming a classic and while the artwork might not be amazing because of use what seems to be a lot of clip art styles then it might be or stock art rather but it's not too bad. The board itself looks quite nice. So what do you do in terraforming Mars? 
When players will each represent a corporation that you have at the start of the game, you'll be aiming to transform Mars into this habitable planet, okay? So what we're doing is completing for these terraform and millstones and wads that are out on the board. So you'll have a look at that and see what you're trying to meet. The players can acquire more cards that you have, because essentially it's driven by cards. You'll be drawing a certain amount each turn. And they'll decide how many to buy, because it costs you to buy, then then you'll be placing them into your hand, and then to build those technologies, you're going to have to pay the cost of them as well. So the cards can give you immediate bonuses as well as increasing your production of different resources that you've got. So I'm trying to get this bit of engine going. Now many cards also have requirements, um, and they become playable when the temperature track or the oxygen track or even those that you cover increases enough. So you have to be careful what cards you're playing when you play them. Now, buying cards is expensive, so there's a balance between buying a card and actually playing them. So when you buy them, you need to make sure you've got enough resources to be able to play the card as well. Now your basic income as well as your basic score is based on your terraforming rating. So how are your income is complement with your production. And you also get 50 points from other resources. Now, each player tracks, uh, so it keeps track of their production, which is on your player board. And what you'll be doing is it uses six different types. Now, in your game board, you'll compete. Um, you'll be looking at these resources and moving on to increase that production. But what helps is the cards that you'll be playing as well that help increase that production. Now, you'll also be competing on the main game board by placing these tiles out to expand and place city tiles, ocean tiles, and green tiles. Uh, so you'll be competing for these different milestones and awards. So there's a lot of tabloid building here, and you're trying to get that engine. That's the main focus here, but I can't ignore the main board because you have to build territories. That's going to give you the most points, but your cards will help the, the production of that. So you might be getting a fungi farm going to grow lots of fungi, giving you lots of resources. And it's quite a fascinating game. Now, like I said, the artwork is not amazing because a lot of stock art is used, so it's quite inconsistent throughout, but the actual board itself is lovely. The play board doesn't look that great, but it's an, quite an interesting, engaging game. So let's now move on to our next one of number four. And this arguably is possibly the best design board game I've ever played. Do I love it? No. But I think it's brilliantly designed. That's Brass Birmingham. You can pick this up for £60. Now, Brass Birmingham essentially is an economic and network strategy game. Now, in each round, players will take turns according to the turn order track. There's even two actions to perform. Okay, so you can either build, which is basically you pay the required resource and place an industry tile out. You can then create a kind of network. So you add these rail and canal links, you'll be expanding your network. So you're trying to get from city to city and, and down to the dock because uh, you need to be able to sell goods. You can then develop, which is basically, you just increase the effective point, uh, effective point value of a particular industry you're trying to sell goods in. And then you can sell your cotton and manufacturing goods and pottery. But of course, you need to create certain connections and links now, you can take a loan as well, which you will do, which can be a fairly permanent loan. And then you can scout as well. That's basically just discarding three cards and taking a well location and industry card. So there's a bit of network building here and then gathering resources to take them from one place to another. And it's quite fascinating, but streamlined and well designed in how the game functions. It's quite a dark theme. Um, so if you're not into this kind of dark industrial theme, it may not be a, a game for you. I find this quite a bit dry, but it is a game that functions and mechanically works brilliantly well. I'm just not enamored by the theme. I mean, Birmingham isn't exactly the greatest tourist destination in the world, is it? So, but the industry revolution was quite important there, as well as other cities around the UK. So let's now move on to our next one, number three. This is a classic, and I put this above others because I just felt this loved by so many people and at the price point, offers great value for money. Agricola, the revised edition. And you pick this up at £40. And there's quite a lot going on this. Now, if you want a more strict, streamlined version, they'll check out the family edition of Agricola instead. So what do you do in Agricola? Well, players will begin the game with two family members. It's just meeples. And then you'll be able to grow your family over the course of the game. Now, this allows you more actions and more family members you've got, but needs more food because the more you've got, the more food you need to feed your people in this game. Now, you can also draft, you, know, you draft these occupation cards at the start of the game that give you benefits. So you'll be playing cards to help and benefit you as you're taking, taking out your actions. Now, beginning with the start and play, you'll be placing a family member in an action space or 
an action card. So what will happen is the action card is laid out, essentially occupation. So what will happen, those will be flipped over certain points during the game that will be able to give you more uh, different spots to go to. For example, you might be able to go to a spot that then gives you um, the oven to be able to cook bread because you've got the materials to cook bread. So you'll be able to uh, get more food or perhaps a spot to get more better animals. Now, what you'll be doing is you'll be repeating those action spaces until the harvest phase. Now, the harvest phase is quite important because it goes through three, three different phases. What will happen, the first thing is players will remove one grain of vegetable token from each sawn field that they've got. Now, this next phase is each player must then feed each of the family members. If you don't, you'll get a begging token. And then phase three is if you have at least two animals, have a baby, you know, have another animal. So you'll be expanding. You've got to be careful because they'll run away if you, if you don't uh, make sure they're enclosed in a fence. And now it's really important that you build up your pastures, you put fences around them. That's going to give you points, different animals and groups of animals. But you have to feed your people and you have to be careful because you have to get the ovens. Now I've seen this game where people have taken an oven to prevent another player getting an oven and that's crippled them. And then you get those begging tokens, they're harsh and really punish you. There's a fascinating agriculture game. If you like kind of farming, you'll love this game. It's without a doubt one of the better ones. Now, I could have put a uh, caverna on here instead. That is arguably better, but I haven't played the full version of caverna. I've only played cave versus cave, so it would be unfair in doing that. So let's now move on to number two. This might be a shock and a surprise to a few people. Robinson Crusoe, and you can pick this up for £50. Very thematic. You are stranded on this desert island and you've got to try and figure a way to survive. So what do you do in Robinson Crusoe? Well, at the start of each round, you'll be drawing the top card from an event deck and you'll resolve that event. They will then check your morale, which is really important because you'll be penalised if you don't uh, keep your morale up. Now, if you're the first player, you'll gain or discard determination tokens. Um, which is basically, oh, you can heal one wound. Now, you can't discard, if you can't discard enough tokens and you don't have enough, then what you need to do is take a wound per missing tokens. You have to be careful of that. You'll then take wood and food according to the sources um, on the island's tile where the camp is. Now, then each player takes their actions and then you'll be assigning your player pawns and then resolving their actions, collecting treasure and building items. Now, the weather phase is then done by rolling a die and resolving the outcome. And then the night phase comes along, which means that you discard one food or take two wounds. So there's quite a lot there, and you'll be exploring this small little map, and then you can gather resources. You can roll a die. To, you can guarantee one resource and roll a die, try and get more, but it might get nothing. So you're trying to it's a little bit push your luck. And the weather can really affect the way this game plays out as well. Very thematic, but it is tough. This is an extremely difficult and challenging game. So we've got really good soul playing this, but this is one of the toughest games you will come across. Now, if you want a challenge, then check out Robinson Crusoe. Very thematic, very challenging. Certainly, you'll get a lot of play of this because you'll be ripping your hair out trying to figure out how you're going to beat the game. Let's now move in to our number one. What is our top spot? I don't think many will disagree with this. Pandemic Legacy Season 1, coming in at £50. So what is a Legacy game? Essentially, you'll be this is Pandemic, but you'll be ripping up cards, you'll be putting stickers on cards, and the game will evolve over the course of, four, of 12 seasons, 12 months throughout the seasons. So if you fail, don't worry. The game will help you and make it a little bit easier. You can fail so many times before you fail completely. But the game will take you through this story and it will evolve. It's pandemic where you'll be curing these viruses, these diseases. And what you'll be doing is then evolving through this story where things and events will change. I don't want to give away too much because I don't want to spoil the story. This is a great journey. If you like pandemic, you will love it. This game, this is what I do, is such a thematic and enjoyable, engrossing experience. And the good thing is, once you finish, you can kind of keep the board as it is and play it like a new version of Pandemic. I can do what some people do and put it in a frame and stick it on your wall. So we hope you've enjoyed that. That's our top ten value for best board games at forty to sixty pounds. Let me know in the comments down below. Do you agree with the list? I think there might be a couple of uh, particular contentions 
um, that might get shifted around on your list. So let us know down below if you agree or don't agree with this list. And also, please consider subscribing to the channel. Yes, the ones who keep watching the videos and don't hit that subscribe button. And give our videos a thumbs up. It really does help the videos and the channel grow and is much appreciated. Like always, check out our other videos in this series and also go to the playlist. There are lots of great videos and we're putting more and more top tens up. So do check them out if you haven't already. Until next time, my name's Jay Sears. Thanks for watching.